uh, for participating in this uh, Concrete uh, Sustainability Hub webinar. Uh, my name is Jeremy Gregory, and I'm the Executive Director of the Concrete Sustainability Hub, and uh, this is a, a first uh, a webinar we're doing like this would to share the work that we're doing in the Concrete Sustainability Hub and um, we're actually uh, recording it so that uh, people who can't make this time will be able to uh, listen to it and see it uh, later uh, on YouTube. Um, as I said, we have uh, everyone on mute so we keep down the background noise, <clears throat> um, but there's a, a chat window that you can use to ask questions. We'll have opportunity to answer some of those questions once we uh, grow th go through this. So. Uh, just as a brief overview, the Concrete Sustainability Hub was started in uh, 2009, and it's uh, jointly funded by the Portland Cement Association and the Ready Mix Concrete Research and Education Foundation. And there's a couple different elements of the Concrete Sustainability Hub's uh, research. We have a, a lot of different projects that we've been participating in, <clears throat> but they are primarily focused around uh, buildings-related uh, research and pavements-related research. And um, what we're going to do over this series of these uh, webinars, which are approximately going to take place uh, every month or so, um, will be, uh, in the beginning, we'll be giving an overview of our buildings-related research, which is happening uh, today, and then uh, also we'll be uh, talking about our uh, pavements-related research in the next one, and then after that we'll be going into specific topics within them. So for today, you can kind of consider this as an overview of our buildings-related research, uh, and then in future webinars we'll be getting into some of the details of the specific topics. So. Um, so with that, I'm just going to uh, dive right in and talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, some of our buildings-related research. And uh, in particular, I want to talk about what <clears throat> motivated our research, uh, and that is, you know, that buildings have significant impacts so on a global scale. They have uh, significant uh, consumption of water, uh, energy, and contribute significantly to uh, greenhouse gas emissions and solid waste generation. And, and as a result, you know, the, resi the, the market for what are, you know, no broadly known as green buildings uh, is increasing. This is showing a chart of uh, <clears throat> the residential market and uh, how it's uh, increasing, um, but there's also uh, an increase in construction related to uh, the LEED design standard, which is, of course, uh, another metric of uh, uh, green buildings, and this, this is more related to commercial construction. What's actually, uh, the data show that <clears throat> the green building industry is growing faster than non-green construction. So there's certainly a lot of demand there, and what's interesting is that some studies have shown that uh, the client demand is a major driver for growth. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in green buildings. Uh, I think one of the things that we'll talk about here, though, is that there's a lot of uncertainty on what it means to be a green building and how do you measure that. That's one of the areas we're going to uh, make a contribution in. Uh, another major interest for us when it comes to buildings is hazards, uh, whether they be natural hazards or man-rate hazards, you know, uh, hazard-related property damage uh, is significant, you know, $377 billion uh, over a period of 96, 2014. Um, and, and so that's really significant, and I, I think that uh, uh, developing ways to mitigate against damage from those hazards is really important. Another interesting uh, uh, dynamic when it comes to buildings is uh, the role that cities are playing. You know, they, they cover a very small fraction of the land, but have a huge amount of the population and are significant contributors uh, to greenhouse gas emissions. And projections show that that's uh, only going to increase. So within the uh, context of this, you know, this really motivates uh, the research that we're doing in the Concrete Sustainability Hub, and uh, our mission is to develop breakthroughs that lead to more sustainable <clears throat> and durable infrastructure, buildings, and homes, and we have a three-pronged uh, strategy by which we do that. <clears throat> One is providing the scientific basis for informed decisions, two, demonstrating the benefits of a life cycle view and uh, transferring that research uh, into practice. Our core philosophy, you know, is that we're we're trying to build for life, uh, using this acronym here. <clears throat> a lot of our uh, research, the core tenets are that it includes life cycle thinking, innovation, 
fiscal responsibility, and environmental leadership. And all of those things frame uh, the work that we're doing. A unique element of the Concrete Sustainability Hub is that our approach is holistic and multidisciplinary. We have a team of people, uh, some of whom focus on the science of cement and concrete, uh, in particular at the very small scale, uh, the molecular level uh, and above. We also have people <clears throat> who specialize in looking at uh, engineering-related challenges and also uh, economic and environmental implications or aspects of uh, those different designs. Really, um, a, a core component of what we do is trying to support sustainable uh, infrastructure design decisions. Um, but what's important to keep in mind is that sustainable infrastructure is really a balance, and you achieve it by increasing the performance of the infrastructure or the, the, the buildings, uh, reducing, reducing costs and uh, reducing environmental impacts. Uh, and what's important in the uh, design process is that you analyze and balance uh, trade-offs among those three different elements. And what I've shown here uh, in, in black underneath each of these is that um, th th those are the ways that you go about doing that. Uh, one is um, you increase the performance by engaging in the design process and trying to improve it that way. <clears throat> Reducing costs, uh, you know, way you can analyze that is through a life cycle cost analysis, LCCA. And environmental impacts are analyzed using a uh, life cycle assessment. Um, so, so those are the, the, the core elements of what we do. I mentioned the life cycle perspective is really fundamental to what we're doing. And the reason why is that, you know, there's multiple mechanisms for reducing environmental impact and cost, but they need to be analyzed within a life cycle perspective. So, for example, some people say that uh, you can reduce environmental impact or cost by focusing on materials production, uh, that is, uh, using for example, using recycled content or reducing energy of materials production, and that, that, that certainly uh, can make a contribution. Another uh, lever that you have is to, uh, uh, in the design and construction process. If you can design a product to use less material, that will uh, uh, reduce environmental impacts and likely costs, and creating longer lasting designs is also an element of that as well. Um, what we call the use or operational phase of buildings or infrastructure, <clears throat> anyways, you can reduce energy consumption uh, or, or, for example, heat island impacts. Those can also be uh, important. And, and lastly, looking at, at end of life and enabling uh, material recovery or planning for uh, component reuse is also uh, one thing that you can do. The key component here is that, you know, you have to be able to prioritize which of these mechanisms are going to give you the most bang for your buck. And so that requires a trade-off analysis of performance and life cycle environmental impacts and uh, cost. <clears throat> uh, so you have to really look at those in the full, complete uh, life cycle perspective. So, um, what I... Uh, want to do before we go much further into some of the work that we're doing is, is do a couple uh, definitions. One, I mentioned this approach of uh, life cycle assessment, and this is basically a method for quantifying environmental impacts throughout the life cycle. So uh, if each of these boxes represent uh, different uh, processes within the life cycle, for example, you know, this may be uh, 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 digging out limestone from the earth and then transforming that into cement and then adding that to uh, make sure to make concrete. Um, a life cycle assessment involves uh, quantifying within each of those processes the energy and raw material inputs and then uh, the releases to land, air, and water. Uh, and what we can do is then sum that up to all of those impacts across the, the whole life cycle to get uh, essentially the, the footprint of that product or uh, process. So that's life cycle assessment. Another approach uh, that's often used is life cycle cost analysis. Uh, and this is a method for evaluating the uh, total cost of ownership. Uh, so if we have a, uh, uh, two different alternatives that we're comparing and they have different uh, initial construction costs, in this case, A is higher than B, uh, they may have different operational costs, though, throughout their future. A obviously has lower operational costs. Uh, and so we can transform all of those uh, individual building expenditures through the present value of those costs into a life cycle cost, okay? And in this case, you know, A has a lower uh, life cycle cost. 
Um, there's uh, four main areas of research that we have within the Concrete Sustainability Hub. Um, and what we're trying to do is basically develop research that can be used to support more robust uh, decisions. So we have uh, research in life cycle assessment, uh, life cycle cost analysis with hazard resistance, <clears throat> building energy consumption, and uh, city energy consumption as well. And what I'm going to do is give you a flavor of some of the work that we're doing in each of these areas. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, in future webinars, we'll be diving into uh, them uh, in more detail. So, so I'm going to start with this first one on um, life cycle assessment. One of the things that we've observed is that there's a chasm between uh, quantifiable green building tools and what designers are actually using. So if we have our chasm here, there's a disconnect. And on the one side, there's a lot of uh, buildings-related life cycle assessment literature and tools. Um, <clears throat> and so there's quite a bit of case studies out there uh, and tools that look at different aspects of the life cycle. But well, when we talk with architects, builders, developers, and consumers, it, most of them aren't using uh, these tools. And so what we're trying to do with our research is actually to try to bridge that uh, chasm and, uh, and connect those two. So we have a couple different elements of the work that I'm going to talk about. One is we've done some detailed comparative life cycle assessments of uh, six buildings in two climates. We've also spent some time uh, surveying architects and, and home builders. And then lastly, we've um, created a tool that can be used to streamline life cycle assessment for early design decisions. So let me start with that first topic about the detailed comparative LPAs that we've done. Um, <clears throat> we analyzed the two different climates, uh, Chicago and Phoenix, uh, a cold climate and a warm climate uh, for buildings that were designed to code. And we used some uh, reference buildings. We looked at a single family home and a multifamily building. And for each of these, uh, we looked at two designs. One is a wood frame and the other is a insulated concrete form, so, which is specific type of uh, concrete construction technology. Um, then we also looked at a uh, commercial building, an office building, and looked at two designs in steel versus concrete. So three different designs in uh, two different climates, <clears throat> all of them uh, designed to code. So what were some of our findings? Uh, what I'm going to talk about are life cycle impacts and using this metric global warming potential, uh, which is basically the amount of carbon dioxide across the whole life cycle. Um, and first, what I'm just looking at is the energy use global warming potential. And uh, how you read these is basically this shows the different uh, exterior walls. Um, <clears throat> these are the different locations. And then these are the building types. And what's plotted here is that energy use uh, over 60 years. So what we found is that, um, you, you know, generally the, the, the concrete structures had about 3 to 10 percent uh, less, uh, and this varies depending on what kind of uh, building that you're uh, talking about. But what we also look at is what we call the embodied environmental impacts. And so this is basically the amount of uh, environmental impacts that are associated with the materials and the construction. So what happens uh, pre-use. Um, what's interesting here when we compare the designs is that concrete generally has uh, 7 to 31 percent uh, higher environmental impact. Um, but what I didn't talk about is what was the, the scale of the y-axis here, and that's uh, really important to look at. Because then when you combine them and look at the, across the whole life cycle, what you can see is that <clears throat> embodied impact is, uh, is, is pretty small, um, and uh, particularly compared to the uh, energy consumption over that whole uh, life cycle. So when you look at that, then you know the, the concrete is about five to eight percent less. And and I I don't you know we have this note here about how results are applicable for this case study only. And we spent a lot of time thinking about these designs and trying to make them fair, but they're certainly not the the be all and end all. We don't mean to imply that this is always going to be the results that you see. The, uh, the, the key message that we have is that life cycle perspective is really important, uh, that for most buildings, that energy use is going to dominate compared to the embodied impact. Uh, and even as buildings become more energy efficient, uh, it's going to be quite a while before uh, both of those become uh, equivalent. But once again, that key message that that life cycle perspective is uh, really important. 
So that was the work that we did on, on the more detailed life cycle assessments. We also spent some time interacting with uh, architects uh, to get a better sense of how they incorporate environmental impacts into designs. And so we surveyed uh, 16 architectural firms along with uh, several home builders and developers and conducted three focus groups uh, with Boston area architects. And some of our key questions, when are design decisions made, which tools are used throughout the process, and what are challenges uh, to utilizing life cycle assessment. Um, and we, we focused initially on smaller buildings, including uh, single-family homes and multifamily homes. Uh, so that was the, the scope of what we're talking uh, about here. <clears throat> One of the, the key findings we had is that, you know, the, the, the details of what goes into a building are not available until late in the design process. So if we have our schematic here of what the design process is, and these are different decisions that are made about you know, foundations or, or, you know, windows and exterior walls, you know, um, the, the detailed decisions usually occur later in the uh, design process, right? So um, what's challenging about that is that, you know, it's difficult and costly to make impactful changes late in the design process, right? So you can influence the performance of the building uh, uh, early on in the design process, and you, your cost of making changes really increase as you get later into that design process. But because that's when the details are available, you know, that's usually when your environmental assessments are done is at the end of the design process. So what's really needed is, uh, you know, approaches that can be used early on in that design process and also to have feedback that accounts for the uncertainty that occurs early in that uh, design process. So, so this was, uh, it, you know, a really important uh, information for us, you know, to find out that uh, details are not available until late in the design process. Other comments we got, you know, is that there was just limited demand for life cycle assessment for customers. So, you know, I made that point early on that customers are asking for green buildings. That doesn't necessarily mean they're saying we want this to be a quantifiable uh, element of what, what we're doing. The other thing is that life cycle assessments are considered too costly or uh, time consuming. And I think that's because there's a fundamental tension in life cycle assessment between cost and credibility, right? <clears throat> Usually, uh, if you want high credibility, that means you're going to have to spend a lot of time and, and you know, perhaps money in order to uh, reach that point. Um, and, and, and that's a, a challenge. And as a consequence, you know, a standard building life cycle assessment model is based on kind of this high cost and high uh, credibility. Um, what you need is, is essentially what's known as a bill of activities. It includes the amount of materials that go in the building, uh, the amount of other processes uh, like transportation and energy consumption. And those are multiplied times uh, specific impact factors for uh, each material in order to get those overall life cycle impacts. And to do that, you need a, a pretty detailed uh, description of the, the, the building. So this is certainly something <clears throat> that can and is used, but it has this challenge that it really can only be used late in the design process. So um, what we're doing at, at in the Concrete Sustainability Hub is developing a streamlined building life cycle assessment model. And the whole purpose is to try to reduce that cost but maintain the uh, credibility. And we do it using this approach called the Building Attribute to Impact uh, Algorithm. <clears throat> and it has similar components to a, a standard LCA, but um, in, instead of relying on a detailed description of the, like the materials and the components in the building, rather uh, we use attributes that uh, designers are already uh, uh, incorporating into their design, and then we use what we call attribute to activity models to map those attributes into what's used in an LCA. So the designer doesn't really have to be uh, involved in the LCA itself, rather it's just describing attributes of the building. Another <clears throat> key component is that we use uh, an approach called under-specification, uh, where uh, essentially a designer doesn't have to put in a lot of details about what goes into that uh, building. Uh, so we use what we call low fidelity and high uncertainty data. Um, 
So that is, uh, rather than being very specific about, say, something like which kind of wall system is being used, and rather someone can just say, I don't know, and then <clears throat> um, we uh, essentially incorporate the environmental impacts of all kinds of wall systems. And so uh, we can start out by basically saying, you don't need to be specific, but we can capture the uncertainty across this assumption that you're using any kind of wall system. And then the last component is that we have what we call a probabilistic triage. And this allows you to identify which data is really important with limited <clears throat> efforts. So you can underspecify things and say, I'm going to be rather generic and then let the triage components identify here are the specific elements that you need to provide more details on. So how it looks is that basically um, a user starts out with that underspecified <clears throat> design uh, information, so very generic about the attributes uh, of the building. Uh, we run our model, which includes uh, many different uh, simulations so using a, a Monte Carlo approach, and then we get results that include both embodied impacts and use phase impacts, and then a range of uncertainty. And what we can do using our triage is say, you know, here are the key components that should be specified further in order to reduce that uncertainty and get a uh, better result. And so the good thing is that uh, someone who's using this would then um, refine the attributes uh, through uh, further specification um, and then can lower that uncertainty to uh, uh, reach a desired result. So, so the approach has many different benefits. One is that the building design attributes are inputs uh, instead of, like I said, what, you know, the materials or the amount of materials or energy consumption that go into the uh, building. Uh, we also, we combine both embodied and uh, energy analyses, which is something that's usually not done in uh, most uh, LCA tools. Those are considered uh, separate. Feedback is provided on the uh, key parameters, which <clears throat> allow one to determine which areas uh, 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 more detail is necessary. And so that the, uh, another benefit is that you, you don't need to provide details on everything, just, just the component, components that are most important. So, and lastly, we quantify uncertainty for those different impacts. And so that enables one to have uh, essentially a risk analysis of uh, how uh, likely it is that the environmental impacts will meet these different attributes. So, so that uh, wraps up our work in a life cycle assessment. What I'm going to do now is transition to some of our work on uh, life cycle cost analysis with uh, hazard resistance. And um, this uh, comes back to, you know, our, 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 what we mentioned, uh, the importance of considering uh, hazard resistance and uh, resilience in building design. And what we've uh, done is incorporated this quantitative hazard resistance into a life cycle cost analysis framework. So we start with um, the uh, embodied environmental impacts. Uh, in, or sorry, excuse me, the, the, the initial construction cost in, in building um, and then also energy use throughout the lifetime of the building, <clears throat> uh, any type of replacement that occurs due to normal uh, wear and tear, uh, and, and then cost associated with end of life. And then another element that we have is uh, uh, a hazard repair cost. And this combines the probability that a hazard will occur with damage from that hazard. And the way that we calculate it is by uh, looking at uh, hazard curves, which say, you know, here's the likelihood that a hazard uh, of a specific intensity will occur. So let's say like a, a, a hurricane. We get those kind of curves from uh, government agencies. Then we combine that with the fragility curves for the building. And so this says, you know, for a specific uh, level of hazard, how likely is it that you will have uh, minor, moderate, major, or, or severe damage? <clears throat> we can combine those um, and then get basically a damage model across the whole lifetime of the building. So this says, you know, over the 50 years of the building, how likely is it that you'll have minor, moderate, major, or severe uh, damage? And then what we can do is incorporate those into a life cycle cost analysis 
and look at, for a couple different design alternatives, we can look at how those costs evolve over time. Uh, and based on differences in initial costs and then operational costs, we can calculate a payback period for a more uh, hazard-resistant design. So we've uh, implemented uh, this approach uh, looking at a couple different uh, buildings in uh, different locations. Uh, and this example I'm showing here is a two-story wood frame house um, that would be located in San Francisco uh, where there's earthquakes, New Orleans where there's hurricanes, and Charleston where there's uh, both. And what we can see here uh, are the different costs uh, throughout the life cycle. Um, and this is uh, uh, showing the present value of the life cycle here on this axis. Uh, and as you can see, initial costs dominate, but there's also costs for energy, maintenance, <coughs> uh, more substantial renovations. And then uh, what you can see in yellow is hazard, cost of hazard repairs due to earthquakes and purple or hazard repairs due to a uh, hurricane. And there's two different designs right here, a conventional design and a more enhanced design. And the enhanced designs don't have really significant um, enhancements to them. It's just kind of some, a few uh, uh, little things that can be done to uh, improve the hazard resistance either to earthquakes or hurricanes. And what you can see is the enhanced designs are always uh, more expensive because of those additional costs. But what's interesting, they also have lower repairs due to hazards. What you can also see is that uh, in the earthquake case, the hazard repairs are very small. It's almost uh, too small to see. And in Charleston, it is, it's, it's uh, significantly small. That's a couple things. You know, one, we're talking about residential buildings here where uh, in an earthquake there's probably <clears throat> much less likely to have damage than uh, taller structures. The other thing is just that earthquakes are much less likely uh, than hurricanes. What you can see on um, for the hurricane damage is that actually in the case of this really this conventional building in New Orleans, over the whole uh, lifetime of the building, you end up spending more in repairs due to hazards than the initial cost. Um, and there's much less cost due to hazards in the more hazard resistant design. We can combine that with um, uh, uh, payback periods, and so here's this, uh, the, the cumulative life cycle net present value. <clears throat> and um, what you can see is that the more enhanced designs have higher initial costs than the uh, conventional, but then lower life cycle costs because you're paying less for uh, hazard repairs. Um, and so <clears throat> um, we can see is in San Francisco, you never get a payback for that more enhanced design. But uh, in Charleston, you're talking about a five-year payback. In New Orleans, it's a two-year payback. So, so clearly, the amount of payback period and the amount of hazard depends on your uh, location, and it depends on the type of, of building you're talking about and the type of design and mitigation features that you're talking about. So while that's important information, one of the things that we find is that there's uncertainty uh, in, in how much um, people are willing to invest to mitigate against hazard resistance. And um, an example we have here is, <clears throat> let's say you have uh, two different designs, um, and let's say that we knew that design B was uh, more hazard resistant, so it costs, costs more in the beginning, um, but then the hazard costs are less throughout the, the life cycle. So just like what we were talking about, a, a more hazard resistant design would have lower hazard related costs in the future. Um, so in this case, though, we could say that uh, the, the, there is an additional amount that you're willing to spend on uh, mitigation, and we know that in this case that their total life cycle costs are uh, the same. But in some cases, those aren't known. Let's say we, we just know that between these two cases that um, we know that the hazard cost of this design will be less, um, but this let's say this is the initial cost of this one. Um, if we want to compare these different designs, we can take that initial cost and then say, here's an additional amount that um, you could spend on mitigation <clears throat> to break even on it throughout its entire life cycle. So it's a way to, to bound, essentially, how much you're willing to invest in that uh, hazard mitigation. In this case, we're saying you have room to spend an additional 14% um, on um, hazard mitigation. And so we call that the break-even mitigation percent. It's the amount you're willing to spend on mitigation um, uh, above and beyond a baseline to break even throughout the lifetime uh, of that building. 
And one of the things that we've done, um, we've used the FEMA's uh, benefit cost analysis tool and then developed a meta model based on that that allowed us to look at how this break-even mitigation percent uh, changes by county. Uh, and in this case, we're looking at uh, hurricane-related damage, which is why we're only showing <clears throat> the east coast and uh, the south of the U.S. Uh, and this is a particular case where we're looking at uh, a low to mid-rise uh, building um, and designs that are usually done conventionally uh, using wood and then comparing that with a, a, <clears throat> a design that's uh, specifically been enhanced to mitigate against uh, uh, hurricanes uh, using uh, concrete. And what you can see is that that break-even mitigation percent uh, varies drastically. And not surprisingly, in some of the inland uh, counties, you know, the, the number's uh, close to zero, which means that basically you get very little uh, difference in your hazard cost, so, it, so there's not really an additional amount that you would want to spend on hazard mitigation. But in some of the uh, coastal counties, what you can see is that the percents can be quite high. And uh, one of our highest ones here is 18.6%, which occurs down here in southern Florida. <clears throat> Here's an example in West Palm Beach um, where you can get into a bit more of the numbers. And essentially, this is uh, like an, an initial investment that you would spend uh, on, say, a, a building of this type, you know, around $9 million. Um, and then this is the amount for that baseline design that you would spend on hazard repairs throughout its life cycle. <clears throat> and you compare that with, for the more enhanced design, um, uh, a much lower amount that you would spend on hazard repairs. So this is basically, this is an upper bound on what you could spend on mitigation investment and still break even over its life cycle. So it's a way of, of kind of, a, of, of bracketing that. All right, now I'm going to move on to uh, some of our research on uh, building uh, energy consumption. <clears throat> and there's a couple different components to it. One, coming back to those uh, detailed life cycle assessments that we did. Obviously, we had quite a bit of uh, energy analyses uh, that we did. And uh, one, one of the interesting elements that we found is that, you know, air tightness is, is, is really important. Uh, in fact, one of the more uh, dominant factors when it comes to quantifying environmental impacts. And so. Uh, you know, anything you can do to increase the tightness of a wall, and particularly uh, in this case for the, the insulated concrete form wall, is going to uh, have the most significant opportunity to reduce those uh, energy uh, ex expenditures. And that can have a really big impact on that whole life cycle assessment. Another uh, analysis that we did was looking at um, <clears throat> the impacts of thermal mass, and we created a, a simple model of a building that was a very simple cube, and then uh, essentially used some models to see how that thermal mass impact varies depending on your location in uh, the U.S. And, uh, you know, not surprisingly, we found the benefit really varies with the climate type. <clears throat> in hot and dry climates, you get more savings in the winter, and in cold climates, you get more savings from having thermal mass in uh, the summer. Um, but the, the thermal mass benefits depend on the location, and this is showing uh, annual energy savings. We also have results for summer and winter that are in a report um, on this. Um, but what you can see is that, uh, particularly in the West Coast, you get a lot of those, those benefits. Um, and around here, they have, you know, really like a, a Mediterranean-type climate where you can make benefits of this in both the summer and the winter. But it just in some places, it makes you get a lot more benefit uh, than, than others. So. Uh, transitioning now to some of our work on uh, city uh, energy <clears throat> consumption. And the way that we look at uh, city energy consumption is really building off of this multi-scale <clears throat> approach that we have. And so we obviously are, are looking at uh, building uh, envelopes where, where there's different elements of that. Um, but then that has uh, an impact on the building energy consumption, and building energy consumption affects uh, city energy consumption. So you need to have <clears throat> all these things uh, uh, tied together in uh, our in, in uh, analysis. So when it comes to city energy consumption, uh, we actually did a case study looking at Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, we got data on gas consumption for 
uh, the entire city. So we didn't get electricity uh, just starting out here with, with natural gas. And what we did is uh, develop some simplified models that can be used to calculate the impacts of uh, different retrofits. <clears throat> and they had to be simplified models because we're scaling these across the uh, entire city. So, um, uh, and what we did is we showed how you can analyze the gas consumption and look at the impacts of uh, different energy consumption and how <clears throat> that changes depending on the retrofit strategies that you use. So, one of the things that can be done is to uh, assign retrofit priority based on this uh, analysis. So this is showing a map of uh, Cambridge, and you can see that <clears throat> each building in there has a different retrofit uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, priority. And the retrofit priority can be based on the magnitude of potential uh, energy savings. So higher priority buildings are the one um, that likely have uh, dominant air uh, infiltration uh, energy loss. And what we showed is that retrofitting those top priority buildings operate, offers really the, the shortest path to save energy at uh, the city scale. And so what this is showing here is the number of retrofitted buildings that you go after, <clears throat> and then the normalized uh, gas consumption of the, uh, the city. And so if you just did kind of random retrofit targeting, then this would be the impact that you would have. You know, for every, like, uh, you know, 1,000 retrofitted buildings, you would decrease consumption by about 10%. Uh, uh, However, if you use uh, the strategy based on the data and the modeling, you get significant um, uh, energy re re reduction. So, for example, if you went uh, for the top 1,000 buildings, you reduce gas consumption by 40%. And the next uh, 5,000 buildings, you reduce it by uh, another uh, 20%. So this type of targeting at the uh, city scale using a combination of data and, and modeling can be really powerful. Um, another thing that we've looked at is basically how the configuration of the city uh, affects <clears throat> the energy consumption of the buildings and the atmosphere around them. Uh, an urban heat island, uh, by definition, is something where temperatures uh, uh, in uh, a downtown ur uh, urban area or, or just any urban area are higher than the rural surrounding areas. Um, and one of the reasons why that can occur is because the heat leaving the buildings uh, affects the neighbors. Uh, and um, <clears throat> as a consequence, uh, you know, the heat that's leaving the buildings is taken on by the other buildings um, around them. Uh, one of the insights that our team had is that, you know, the city layouts resemble uh, molecular structures. So this is showing a map of uh, Los Angeles, California, and then at uh, obviously a like a satellite uh, type scale where this, this would be kilometers. This is much more zoomed in uh, a picture <clears throat> at a very small scale of glassy silica uh, nanoparticles. So in this type of structure here, it's a less ordered layout and a less uh, ordered uh, structure. Um, contrast that with Chicago, Illinois, which has a more ordered layout and a more ordered structure. Uh, and what you can see here at the molecular level is that there are crystalline silica nanoparticles. And so some of the work that we've done is trying to take the insights that we know and the, the modeling tools we can use at the molecular scale and then translate those into being able to describe <clears throat> what the texture of cities is like. Um, and one of the things that we've done is uh, looked at uh, basically how temperature differences are correlated to that city texture. So what you see is that more uh, liquid cities <clears throat> end up being on um, this end of the spectrum and more crystalline cities end up being here. So clearly uh, that city texture has uh, an impact on the amount of the degree to which you see an um, urban heat island effect. So with that, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, close up here and just add a reminder that, you know, the, uh, a big component of our philosophy is that we're trying to 
design or you know create uh, sustainable infrastructure and decision support tools, <clears throat> but to do that really requires this life cycle perspective, and it requires this balancing act of uh, increasing performance reducing cost and uh, reducing environmental impacts, and then analyzing uh, and balancing those trade-offs uh, among them. So while it's important to have work uh, separately in these three areas, it's also important to combine them uh, to really see how we can get uh, the most bang for our buck when it comes to uh, sustainability. So. Um, uh, I, I encourage you to uh, take a look at our website, cshub.mit.edu, where we have uh, lots of additional information on these different elements. Uh, you can also reach us uh, at this uh, email address <clears throat> right here. Um, on our website, we also have uh, a page where you can see the listing of additional webinars that are uh, coming up and uh, how to register, what the topics are, and then how to uh, register for those. So. Um, and with that, I think we can uh, transition to questions, and I'm going to ask for some help from uh, Ann Yu, our uh, communications coordinator, who set this up and is uh, helping to manage the webinar. So, um, Ann, did you get any uh, questions in the uh, chat box? Or? Uh, not just yet, but if anyone has any questions, okay. you should see okay. the chat box uh, in the lower part of your screen. Okay. Please do feel free to send those along. and. We'll All right. We'll wait a minute or two to see if, if any uh, come in. Um, as, as we mentioned, we'll be uh, uh, posting this uh, to YouTube and providing a link for that on our website in case people miss it or want to go back and uh, look at some of the elements again. I'm still not seeing any questions. Does anyone have questions okay. today? All right. Uh, the other thing we can, can people raise their hand to say something? Is that right, too, right? That there, sometimes there's a way on the webinar to be able to do that. So. Oh, there's one. Is it Christian? And so the question is, when is the uh, pavements presentation? And I can answer that, Christian. That's um, okay. sure. That's uh, March second is the plan for the uh, next webinar, and that'll be an overview of all of our pavements-related research. Great. Can you mute that again, please? I can. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So the pavements one um, will be next, and. Uh, it'll be similar where we'll be giving uh, an overview of some of the different uh, uh, projects that we're doing, and then after that, we'll start doing uh, individual webinars on things like, you know, just on life cycle assessment or for buildings or just on uh, life cycle cost analysis for pavements. So the next question is from Adam Auer. Uh, what do you see as the pathway to making LCA and LCCA more accessible to procurement professionals in government? Yeah, um, there's a couple different uh, elements uh, to this that I think are important. <clears throat> you know, one is uh, increasing the demand for its use, you know, getting people to ask for it. Um, and then the other is, I think, uh, streamlining the approaches so that they can be used uh, early on, right? Uh, so there's one is kind of why you would do it, and the other is how. So on the why you would do it, um, I think we have a little bit of a tension some people think that maybe it just it can't be done. And so what we're trying to demonstrate is, is you, you can indeed develop some of these approaches to be used early on in the design process. Um, and that's certainly, you know, our objective in being involved in this. But in terms of the, the why uh, you would do it, you know, you still need to get people to appreciate that the life cycle perspective is uh, important. <clears throat> and so you either, have to kind of speak to some uh, type of desire that they have, or alternatively, you need to um, you either just do it through legislation, or I think you know another opportunity we have is just by changing some of the business models um, that are used. So basically, there's more financial incentives for people to consider a life cycle perspective, and you see a lot of this in. Uh, different different uh, spaces besides just buildings and infrastructure. But um, if we if we get 
you know, change more the model from developers uh, building something and then selling it right away to building and holding it, then that obviously changes some of the dynamics. So I think that's a, it, we need a little bit of both. Uh, we need to uh, uh, increase the incentives for people to think this is important, and then uh, at the same time, what we're trying to help out is showing that it can be done early in the design process to support decisions. Great. The next question is from um, Dane Haggerty. And Dane, I have you unmuted if you'd like to ask the question yourself. Okay, I'll put it out there. What plans are in place for sharing and marketing the results and findings of the research? Yeah. The, um, the, the most prominent way that we try and do this is uh, through our website. And we have a couple different areas on there where um, we try to put all the results together on a particular topic. So, for example, on our um, buildings-related research, then uh, there will be a tab that says, <clears throat> here's all uh, the work that we've done in this space. And we realize that there are different audiences for the work. And so uh, sometimes we have, uh, you know, we obviously have our more scientific uh, publications um, and, and that are published in journals, and we realize not everyone's uh, interested in that. So so we've also created uh, on some topics what we call topic summaries, which are meant to be just, you know, about two pages that summarize the key elements coming out of uh, this work. So a lot of it, like I said, is trying to communicate and summarize those results on our website. Um, but the other way we do it is by trying to just hit the road and uh, speak at different uh, conferences and meetings uh, to share this with people. Um, and then the idea behind that is that we can then um, uh, engage with people more directly, and then if there are opportunities, we'll often uh, try and set up projects where we work with people on implementing uh, some of these uh, methods. So I think that's that's actually a good summary of how we try and do it, is basically <clears throat> communicate things to a broad audience um, on our uh, using material and information that's on our website, and um, then secondly, uh, trying to engage with people more directly uh, via uh, presentations or meetings, and then third, um, uh, more directly in uh, specific uh, collaborative projects. Okay, the next question is, <clears throat> whether we're collaborating with NRMCA's uh, Build with Strength campaign. Yeah, that is a, a, a good question. Um, we are indeed uh, collaborating with them on that campaign. Um, <clears throat> in particular, we're, we're uh, providing support on how you can use these uh, early uh, life cycle assessments uh, to support uh, design decisions, uh, in particular in that campaign. They try and engage with designers uh, and propose uh, alternative designs for more conventional ones. And so we provide the support on uh, doing uh, uh, early stage uh, energy analyses and also life cycle assessment analyses. Um, and where it makes sense, also sharing uh, the results from our uh, resilience analyses as well. So we're um, <clears throat> essentially doing the, the, the quantitative analyses that are needed uh, to be able to, to support uh, some of the decisions that are coming out of them. Great. A follow-up question from Dane, uh, uh, Dane Haggerty with Lafarge Holcomb. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what about the promotion of the LCA tool and incorporation into lead design? Um, for, for that, what we are uh, trying to do is basically uh, see if we can find some more audiences of people who might be considering <clears throat> using this in their design decisions. So, for example, with the uh, uh, NRMCA, they have a design assistance program where they are uh, essentially uh, uh, comparing a couple different designs and looking at the performance. And so, we're trying to use our tools directly in that uh, process. And so. What we're looking for are more partners. Uh, if you know, if, if you're aware of uh, specific uh, cases that are being analyzed where people are making those decisions, and it looks like some of our tools might help, then um, you know we we're, we're glad to see if we can get engaged uh, in in that that process. Great, and that's all the questions we've received. Are there any final questions or additional questions? All right, that, uh, oh, one more just came in. Sure, sure. <laughs> just a thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the next webinar. Oh. And thank you. We are too. <laughs> great, great, great. All right. 
Okay. Well, thanks so much, everyone. We really appreciate you engaging and look forward to uh, talking again at a, a future one. Thank you. Thank you.